From coast to coast and around the world, it's time to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord covers the major Christian events in America and across the world from the heart of Europe. To the tip of Africa. From the centers of Asia. To Central and South America. You're a part of the world's largest prayer and praise gathering. Joining us from Atlanta, Georgia, are president and host of God's News Behind the News television program, Dr. Joe Van Coovering, pastor and messianic rabbi of the Jerusalem Center Beth Israel in Wayne, New Jersey, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn. Founder and President of According to Prophecy Ministries, Evangelist Donald Perkins. Anointed Christian Recording Artists, Larry and Gina Bean. Ready to take your calls, prayer partners from around America. Now your host, founder and president of Voice of Evangelism Ministries in Cleveland, Tennessee, Evangelist Perry Stone! We want to welcome the North American audience and the worldwide audience of TBN. Paul and Jan both felt a necessity with the times that we're now living in and the acceleration of events in such an uncanny manner where Bible prophecy is being fulfilled that we should have a day here on TBN with a special emphasis on what's happening now. How does it affect America? How does it affect the world? What do people who have spent their life studying the Word of God, especially the area of the prophetic, what are they feeling? What are they sensing? What is God saying to them? There are literally tens of thousands in North America and even millions of people, perhaps, and millions around the world that are interested in knowing what is it all about? What does God word ha words have, God's Word have to say about it? Dr. Joe Van Coovering, who is host of God's News Behind the News, who also hosts an international conference each year, is with us. Dr. Van Coovering always has a right now word from God. He's actually made predictions in the past that happened in detail the way the Holy Spirit showed him. Of course, evangelist Donald Perkins, what can I say about this brother? He's not just a teacher, he's a preacher teacher of Bible prophecy, an expert in understanding and discerning the times the way the sons of Issachar did in the Old Testament. And we're very thrilled for the first time on TBN to have a New York Times best-selling author Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, who has written The Harbinger. If you have read The Harbinger book, the author is here on TBN today. You're going to be hearing from him. He's going to be breaking down information that God has given him, part of it that's been written in this book. It's very important that you stay tuned to TBN throughout the entire evening, because at the conclusion of this evening, I'm going to be bringing you a word that the Holy Spirit has given me, because he showed me in the book of Nehemiah, five national things that were happening in his day that are the exact five cycles being repeated now. There is a way out of the mess that we're in. And I'm going to show you from the Bible in what I call an astonishing prophetic pattern in parallel how to get out of it. So ladies and gentlemen, sit back, go get your coffee or your soft drink or your water and your bag of chips. Welcome to TBN Prophecy Evening. Larry and Gina Bean are going to open up singing, Somebody Tell God Thank You, Dr. Vancouvering is coming on the set immediately. We'll see you We are a blessed people, amen? God has been so good. Hey, somebody ought to tell God thank you.
what a way to start it off with a camp meeting song like that, Larry and Gina Bean. We're going to allow some of the pastors to introduce themselves, give the name, their names, and uh, uh, the name of the church where they pastor. So let's do that right now. I'm Dr. Henry Mason, pastor of the First Victory Baptist Church, College Park, Georgia. Sir, good to have you with us. Thank you. Apostle Clarence Potter, Pastor Ellen Nicole Potter, and we're with the City Blessings Church International in Conyers, Georgia. All right. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Rabbi Scott Secular, my wife Judy and I lead Congregation Beth and I here in Atlanta. And your brother, your brother is Jay Sekulow. That's right. So he's the brother of Jay Sekulow. If TBN family knows who that is, don't they, for sure. Thank you, Rabbi, for being here. Bishop Donald Crooms and Tia Crooms. We're from Tabernacle of Praise International Ministries, Beaufort, North Carolina. All right. Good to have you today. Thank you. Pastor Randy Brooks, my lovely wife, Sheila, and we have the privilege of pastoring the Marietta Church of God in Marietta, Georgia. Amen. Great church. Pastor Antonio Mincy and my wife, Tanisha Mincy, and we pastor church, Christians of Grace Ministries in Atlanta, Georgia. God bless you. All right. I'm Kerwin Hunt. I'm Minister of Reconciliation to Christ Jesus, and this is my lovely wife, Brenda. God All right. Bless God bless both of you. I'm Pastor Kurede Akindele, and this is my lovely wife, Elizabeth Akindele. We pastor Victory International Center of the Redeemed Christian Church of God in Mableton, Georgia. All right. I'm Pastor Anthony Walker, and I pastor Kingdom of Christ Church Ministries in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, give them a great big thank you. Give every one of the ministers thank you for being with us. All right. Dr. Vancouvering is coming to the set right now, but Larry and Gina are going to sing a great song so you would know. Enjoy the music, and we're coming back with a prophetic word for you right now in just a moment.
Those kids are singing tonight. I'm telling you. I want to I want to recommend something to the TBN family. Larry and Gina have have uh, completed Gospel Memories. It's 12 songs. This is the best music you'll ever hear. Uh, Joe will agree with me. These kids are great. And you go on their website and get this because it is fabulous. And hey, keep your shouting shoes on in your house. Pr I promise you. This is camp meeting stuff. Amen. Dr. Joe Vancouvering pastors in St. Petersburg, Florida at the uh, Gateway Christian Center, host of a syndicated television program, God's News Behind the News, the author of just over half a dozen books, host International Prophecy Conference. Would you welcome to TBN today, Dr. Joe Vancouvering, my dear friend. <laughs> Joe. Hey, Mr. Stone. So good to be with you. <laughs> good to see you, Perry. And the one thing, the one thing we will not get into is football because we're very competitive there. So we're going to leave football alone and not get right into prophecy. Well, I'm a Bama, I'm a Bama fan too. So you know, but Florida <laughs> State was my. See, my it, it, it'll get carried away here yeah, if we're we not careful. We can't go very far. Joe, we we're, somebody. you know, you've been. How long have you been keeping up with prophetic events? Um, well, you know, my father-in-law was the founder of our ministry, as you know. Great man of God. Founded our ministry in 1948. The same year that Israel was reborn as a nation, God raised up Dr. Dr. Brubaker. Ray Brubaker. And uh, he just took me under his wing. And uh, he kind of instructed me and mentored me. And uh, probably 25 years now, I mean, literally, yeah, 25 years I've been involved in prophetic ministry. Were you interested in it from the beginning, or was it something that kind of grew on you, if you know what I'm saying? Uh, no, I really wasn't. But I, I had an awareness, even as a small child, that, that the Lord was going to come in my lifetime. And I was looking for the Lord to come in my lifetime. And I can even remember as a teenager how the message of the rapture, which you know, First John says this blessed hope is a purifying influence in our life. Mm -hmm. And I know that had I not had the message and really believed it, yeah. you know, you, you and I know this. We live in an hour where most pastors don't want to talk about prophetic things. Most churches won't deal with it. Why do you think that is? I think from, there's from a, a multitude of... As a pastor, I've thought a lot about this over the years. But let me just say this one thing. I think if we recognize the real power of this truth and the power of this message, we wouldn't poo-poo it. We wouldn't, we wouldn't criticize it. Because as a teenage boy, it was the message of the return of Christ that caused me to live a pure life. I'm serious. Mm -hmm. And I thank God. You know, I was a virgin when I married my daughter. She, I mean, my, my, my wife. <laughs> And and uh, that's you know, an over we, fifty blooper, by the yeah, way. Yeah, my my, uh, <laughs> my my daughter is now 25, 26, <laughs> but uh, we'll celebrate thirty years of marriage this year S in just a few months. And I, right. And um, you know, I think I look back on it, and I'll, if I had not believed this message, I would not have been able to have the power to live pure. And I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but I believe there's somebody even listening right now, Perry, is a young person right now, and I believe that. Um, I'm talking to them. But to answer your question, here, here's what I know about pastors. pastors. Pastors don't want to teach anything that they're not fully persuaded of themselves. No, uh, good every point. good pastor knows they're going to stand and give an account for what they taught their sheep. Okay. And we take it very, very seriously, do we not, pastors? And here's the problem. To gain an understanding about prophecy, you can't just read one or two books and have oh, all the answers. Right. It takes a lifetime of study and a pastor is, is sort of a general practitioner as a shepherd. You've got to do the marrying. You've got to do the burying. You've got to do, you know, you've got to lead the youth meeting when the youth guy doesn't show up. You've got to be able to do the music when the, when the music guy. I mean, you have to, you have to yeah. do it all. You have a general practitioner. But just like in the medical field, there are certain specialties that take extra time, extra study, extra wow. teaching, extra class to become a, an expert in the analogy. eyes or the heart or right. something like that. And that's really what it takes to be able to teach the prophetic word. And most pastors have not been able to do that simply because they never had the advantage of the years and years that it takes to develop that understanding. But here's what I tell pastors. If you don't want to teach on Bible prophecy, your people need it. And your people want to receive it. So... Be courageous enough to do the right thing for your congregation and take a week and sit down, pastor, and bring in a Donald Perkins or bring in a Perry Stone or a Joe Vancouver or somebody that you trust 
to teach your people for that week on Bible prophecy because you won't be able to teach it necessarily, and you're not necessarily called to do that. Your assignment is different. But bring in someone who you can trust to do that. Let me add this. Some people don't teach it because they think, I heard a guy say this, it's going to affect the giving of my church. Oh, my God, yes, and, I know. And, Joe, that's the opposite. Isn't if that people, ridiculous? If you, don't you believe if people really believe Christ could come at any moment, they're more apt to give to get the gospel out? That's what I've experienced. Well, that's what I've believed. You know, one of my mentors was Dr. Tim LaHaye. He's still with the Lord, and, and uh, he's still with us, not with the Lord. I, <laughs> I, I almost said Hilton Sutton because Hilton Sutton is now that's with right. the Lord. Just a few, few, you know, short time ago, he went home to be with the Lord. But some of these great prophecy preachers that had such an effect on me. And, you know, they taught us, it's still there, the three things Bible prophecy will do if you really believe it is, number one, it'll make you a soul winner yourself. It's true. Number two, it will cause you to live a pure life because this hope in you purifieth yourself even as you are pure. The verse I was referring right. to a moment ago. And then the third thing is, is it'll cause you to give for world missions. You will be a giver to evangelism. Because you know your time's limited. I believe that. I really do. Now let's get into this right here. What, why do you believe, you've heard it, I've heard it, it's the last days the Lord's coming. What makes it different now, Joe? In your opinion, oh, what makes it different? Oh, a multitude of reasons, Perry. I think even five years ago, I mean, I hate to, you know, get really speculative here, but if the world hasn't changed in the last five years, I mean, look around. We could talk a lot about the Arab Spring or the so-called Arab Spring if you want to. Yeah. That, that really wasn't in place even five years ago. Did um, you see that coming? I didn't even see it coming. Well, you know, all of us... I mean, and that's the way it happened. All of us in America, we, we have the burden on us because of the great liberties that we have enjoyed for so many years. You want to see all people have that same thing. Mm -hmm. I was just in Nigeria two weeks ago. And uh, ministering the gospel to those precious, beautiful Nigerian people. Uh, many tens of thousands got saved. Um, many miracles, many healings. I, I was there with a mutual friend, Pastor Peter Dosick, as you know. And um, the point is, is it's harvest time. I really feel that. And, and there is a harvest awaiting us. But the world, we look at the nations of the world and we want them to have the same liberties and the same freedoms and the same democracy, if you will, that we love here in America. Right. But there's a major problem with that. Perry, well, I think one of the most neglected, overlooked um, parts of Bible prophecy is in the book of Daniel. Now, we all know it and we all study it. Mm -hmm. You know, all of us prophecy guys can teach it and preach it. But in the book of Daniel, as you know, God gave Nebuchadnezzar this dream and, and, and this great image appeared with right. the head of gold and the arms of silver and brass and all the way down. And Daniel was given the interpretation. Now, all Bible prophecy rests on that vision right there. Yeah. All of Bible prophecy, it's if you're like ever going to understand. It's like a foundation. It is. If prophecy. you do not understand Daniel the chapter empires. 2 and, and, and the, right. the empires of the world, you will hopelessly be lost uh, when it comes to explaining Bible prophecy. But here's the point. The last one is the ten toes. Mm -hmm. And Perry, you and I have, have, have uh, over the years, we've tracked on the same track mm -hmm. to understand the Islamic role right. in the book of Revelation and in the last days. Right. And that was something that really wasn't seen 10 or 15 not, years ago, even back, by great no, prophecy not preachers. Not back in the 90s when it we, started, we started realizing that. And many of our colleagues, men that I love, men that I respect, men that you and I know well, right. they may not see it exactly the way we see it, and they try to make Europe this ten-toed kingdom that arises in the last days. Can I just lovingly tell you that it can't be? Mm -hmm. uh, you can't get ten toes on one foot, by the way. There's two feet, okay? It's east and west. And east both. and west. Right. And yes, Europe's involved. Yes, Rome is involved. It is the revived Roman Empire. But here's, I said all that to say this, and this is one of the things that Ray taught me years and years ago, believe it or not, because the toes are iron mixed with clay. Right. And to this day, guys that call themselves Bible scholars are confounded by that and... Great men saw with the light that they had. 
Say but that again, because that's important. Great men saw with the light that they had at that time. At that time, right, exactly. and came to conclusions. It does, they weren't off, wrong, bad. No, they not, weren't bad. Yeah. They weren't evil. They that's saw with they the just, light that they had. That's good, Joe. But you said what? What changes our world now? Right. What's going on in those Middle Eastern nations that we're calling an Arab Spring? I got news for you. All of them, and I could give you quotes, I could give you experts, not from prophecy guys like me, but from people on the ground in world affairs. I just shared a, a, quite a number of them at our prophecy conference just two or three days ago. But the reality is, is it's iron mixed with clay. Mm -hmm. And the great old scholars believed, and Ray taught this, that the iron is despotism and the clay is democracy. Yeah. And the reason that ten-toed kingdom cannot stand, get it, is because they're trying to amalgamate despotism with democracy. Now in Ray's day, he saw that as communism. Iron okay. curtain. Yeah, the, 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 the iron would be communism. How can mm -hmm. communism work with, with, with the clay of, of democracy? But and it never I made believe, sense at that time with Ray's day. And it yeah. did. It made sense to interpret it that way. Right. But the fact is, look what's going on. Right. We're trying to make these nations and these people come together who's been under the leader of a despotic leader, some cruel... Some, some mm -hmm. guy that was, whether it's Gaddafi, whether it was Saddam Hussein, any of these guys you want to mention, Syria. they get yeah. their freedom seemingly and their liberty, right. and they jump out of the pot and into the fire because now yeah. the radical Islamists will take control of those nations. Yeah. And as hard as we want democracy that we enjoy to come to nations of the world, and all of us do as Americans, yeah. but let's go back to the Bible, and I see... What's going on in the so-called Arab Spring is, is going to form ultimately to what Daniel saw as those ten. Hallelujah. I feel yeah. the Holy Ghost right now. Yeah. Because we're living in a day that if we would just study the Word, period. It gets back to the Word. If we sure would does. just study the Word, we wouldn't be taken by surprise. Yeah. And I realize it takes specialists. And I'm so thrilled to have my dear friend Donald Perkins on with his program today. And, and with Jonathan Kahn, a new dear friend, I'd, I'd rather sit down and listen to those two guys talk <laughs> along with you. But the fact is, is the Bible says that there will be specialists even in the kingdom. They're known as the sons of Issachar, mm -hmm. who had understanding of the times and the mm -hmm. seasons. And forgive me while I get off on a pet little box, soapbox, but I'm getting tired of the so-called prophets in the land today that can prophesy this and prophesy that and know absolutely nothing about what God That's has true. already prophesied in That's His true. Word. That's Never true. studied it. Some of them are critical of it. And, and I move prophetically. I mean, God gives words and words of knowledge. Even I was praying tonight, and I believe God wants to do some things among the people who are listening. I believe there's some heart issues. I think there's someone who has a, who's had a major surgery with one of their limbs, and it's not well. God wants to heal you tonight. So I, you know, I believe in all of the gifts to manifest. Yes. But, folks, we got to get back to the Word. We have Amen. a dearth of the Word. We have a famine of the Word today. True. And, and maybe that's the way, maybe that's why I love you so much because I know what a student you are of the Word of God. And, you know, when God connected us, what, 18 years ago, yeah, 19 years at ago? At least that. I've done more television with Perry Stone than any other it's human true. being on the planet. I can be out <laughs> in the middle of nowhere and someone will spot me and say, hey, you're Perry Stone's guy. <laughs> Now that's I said, hilarious. yeah, I'm Perry Stone's guy. <laughs> Amen. You got TV that so right because they've seen us so Can many I times. Can I tell you real quick, not to take your time, but about no. 30 seconds. The early fathers said that Egypt, Libya, and Ethiopia were three countries the Antichrist was going to overthrow out of the ten kings. And Daniel 11 mentions that Egypt and Libya fall to the Antichrist. So when you said those ten kings have to be linked to this Arab Spring. That's what Joe, I believe. That's, that's what the Bible says. Perry, that's what so I believe the Bible teaches. So all you got to do is go back in the Scripture and look at all. It, it starts piecing together. Well, you and I see very much alike on this because we've right. tracked it together over the years and spent time studying things and sharing things together and sharing revelations. Right. And, and not everybody's going to see it the way we do, but that's fine. The truth is, is, is this, this person who we know as the beast, the Antichrist, he is living in the earth today. Mm -hmm. He is ready to emerge. 
I believe, from the nation of Babylon purposely. In my, my little book, Unveiling the Man of Sin, it's not a little book, it's a full-size book. I get into those things. I'm not trying to pitch my stuff, but you know, you and I share a, along these lines and teachings, and I believe, folks, we don't have a lot of time. I'm, I'm going to tell you something. We just had our conference, as you know, three days ago, finished three days ago, and um, it was all, our, our International Prophet Conference is always outstanding, you know, the glory of the Lord. Jonathan Kahn, by the way. Who's here. Who is here tonight. Be coming up on Folks, Tuesday. don't change. I hope I didn't turn you off. I hope you're still watching because the truth is, if you read one book this year, it needs to be The Harbinger. This is the most profound, most, most incredible, and I say that. He's a friend now. He just spoke at our conference Friday night. It was I mean, it was, it was like electric. It was like historic. I told my staff and team, I says, Friday night will be a historic night. And I believe, I said all that to say this, we don't have a lot of time. Do you understand that? These preachers that say, wow. oh, we got 50 years, we got 100 years. Man, walk out, leave. Don't even listen to a guy that'll say something that stupid. This time is honest. We are in that final generation. These days are finally yes. here. And it's Praise time God. to... It's time to serve Christ with all of your heart. And I, and I get back to what I just said. Why would, I, why would I leave my comfortable bed and my beautiful wife and our church and go halfway around the world to Nigeria? Because it's harvest time. That's why. Right. You know, the book of James says that the Lord is waiting patiently mm -hmm. until his return. But what is he waiting for? Go read James. It says he's waiting for the early and latter rain yeah. and the harvest, the precious fruit of the earth. Hallelujah. That's souls. Thank you, Lord. The only thing we can take with us to heaven is souls. That's right. I'm tired of preachers right. preaching and never having an altar call and never challenging anybody to come to Christ. Yes. That's why I love Donald Perkins because he's a true evangelist. And I believe Donald, I'm going to leave it for him. I believe Donald's going to lead thousands of people to Christ in just a few minutes. Hallelujah. But I'm talking to pastors right now. I'm talking to a pastor right now who's ready to quit. I can see you, my brother. I can see a pastor right now who's tuned in, and you've turned, you, you started to write your letter of resignation. My God, you started to say, this is it. I'm through. I'm done. Somebody's going to, somebody's made a bad deal in your church, and you're running. Listen, I'm speaking to you. Don't Praise you quit. God. Press Praise through. God. I challenge you. Thank Don't you. miss this opportunity. It's harvest time. Go get your fire again. Whatever you got to do, get yes, your first yes. love again. That's Don't it, let people it. wear you out and drag you down and Glory let hard times cause you to, to, to deny. Listen, the best days are yet to come. I'm talking Hallelujah. to somebody. You Thank need to... You. I feel that, Joe. You need Hallelujah. to call right now. There's a number on your screen. Yes, yes. I believe there's, there's dozens of pastors listening to me right now, and God wants to put a new fire in your heart, and God wants, he's going to change some things. It's not going to look the same way it did before. It's going to look different yeah. from this day yeah. on, because God is doing something deep inside of you. Perry, I feel that so deep. Can we give the Lord praise right now? Amen. Hallelujah. I believe he's, God is saving ministries. Yeah, yeah. God is saving ministries right I now. I want you to do... Hallelujah. I want you to do two things. Pastor, that's a word of knowledge that Joe had. Go to the phone and call the person at TBN and say, when he said that, God quickened me, yeah. he was speaking to me. Yeah. Let them pray with you and agree with you. It's not time to quit. Take the, get, take the quit option off the table. You don't need to quit. The body needs you. The church needs you. Sinners need you. Your family needs you. Don't quit or give up. I do want to briefly say this, that Dr. Van Coven has written a number of books, and if you will go to his website, you will have information, Unveiling the Man of Sin, uh, Unmasking Jezebel in the Last Days, One New Man, The Key to the End Time Revival. That's just a few of the books he's written. Uh, contact his ministry there, and I believe that anything that comes from this man will be a blessing to you and encouragement and inspiration. And Joe, I want to say that how much I appreciate... Um, I appreciate your friendship. I appreciate the fact that all the time I've ever known Joe Vancouvering, he's never compromised what he stands for or what he believes. He believes it. He stands with it. He lives that way. He's got a wonderful family I sure and, do. and grandbabies. We won't talk about that. We'll be here <laughs> all night if we get into the grandbabies, okay? Yeah. <laughs> but I want to say thank you and uh, go to the website again. And listen, uh, Donald Perkins, in just a moment, will be coming up, and Donald has a word, but I want to emphasize two things quickly. 
Rabbi's coming, Rabbi Khan is coming, who wrote The Harbinger. Never been on TBN before. You've got to hear this man. I'm, Amen. I'm, I'm imploring you. Yes. You've yes. got to hear what he has to say. Yes. It's mind boggling. It is. At the end of the program, I'm coming as number four. I call it the, the cleanup man, I guess <laughs> is how we say it in baseball. Yeah. But I'm coming with the word of the five parallels in Nehemiah's day that are being repeated right now in our nation and the things Nehemiah did to pull the nation out of its problem. It's a word from God. Now, Larry and Gina Bean are coming. I love this song, It's Not Over. Listen to the words. It's going to bless you. We'll be back in just a moment with our second guest.
Thank you, Larry and Gina. Before we introduce our next guest, let me briefly make mention that we completed our Revelation teaching called Breaking the Apocalypse Code. This is the album. It has seven, CV, uh, seven DVDs, 14 hours of teaching with a 109-page study syllabus in this beautiful album, and it took us eight months to edit it with pictures and scriptures. Go to perrystone.org, and I'll tell you how you can get this. If you don't have it, it's available for a little bit longer on the website and through the Manifest Telecast on TBN. So there it is. I wanted to let you know that, that that is now ready. I told you about it before, and now it's available. Well, Donald Perkins, my goodness, what can we say from Lemon Grove, California? Hey. Hallelujah. Great to be with you, Great to be with you Perry. Man. Always. I, I, you know, I could read all of this, but I would rather just let you teach. You got a resume a mile long. So <laughs> let me just go ahead and just, wh where are we at? Since we were here on TBN last, what yes. has been happening? What's God stirring your spirit up with? You know, Perry, there's so much that is going on. Uh, it, it's so hard to keep up with everything that's going on. But I tell you this, and, and Joe stirred my heart because we are living in the end times. You know, he challenged pastors, you know, listen, teach this prophetic message. Uh, uh, it, it will encourage your heart. It will stir you uh, to do God's bidding in the earth. Yeah. You know, a lot of pastors, I really believe, uh, have lost uh, their burden. And one reason for that is because they don't understand the end time message. Yeah. And see, I believe that when we get a, a, a clear message of the end times based on Scripture, uh, that it will ignite your heart. Uh, it will ignite the vision that God has placed in your spirit to go out I don't know if I've ever bidding. asked you this. How did you get connected to prophecy? Well, God I mean, called me. I, I, I uh, believe that I, I was a, I was, uh, I was in a tape room. I was a faithful tape guy at our church. Like running the tape. Running the tape room. That's my really? ministry. I had a burden to run the ministry. Oh. And uh, my pastor one night called uh, uh, all night prayer. And what happened when I called it all night? He called all night prayer. I went to my tape room and I was praying in the tape room, <laughs> and God spoke this calling to my life. I accepted the call of God. What did he God. say to you, though? He, he told me that he wanted me to start studying the book of Revelation and end times. Now, I got to be honest with you. I was one of those guys that was afraid of Revelation. I was a Christian. I loved the Lord, but I was afraid of the book of Revelation because all my life I was taught if you study prophecy or Revelation, right. you could lose your mind. And I got to tell you something. That, that, that is prevalent in a lot of churches where people are afraid of that book. They love God. They're born again. Uh, they're serving God with all their heart. But the book of Revelation or the prophetic books, they will never go into. And you I was one of those guys. You think they're afraid of interpreting it wrong? I mean, not well, getting that, it wrong, and they just say, let's leave it alone. Well, well there's a number of reasons. Interpreting it wrong, uh, fear of the unknown. Uh, yeah. They've been taught uh, to stay away from that book. You know, I believe uh, it's, a, it's a fear of the devil. But when the Lord called me in that little tape room that night, he spoke to my heart. And I said, now, Lord, if you call me to this area of ministry, I said, confirm it to me. And God began to confirm things in my life that I was called. Not only that Praise period, but he God. turned my burden. I lost the desire for that tape room. That was my oh, tape room. And the pastor didn't like that, did he? he? Well, he, he had to let it go. <laughs> had because, to let it go. Because God ignited my heart. I studied. I, I had an insatiable desire to study Bible prophecy. I would go to work. I work construction. I would come home and study eight hours. Oh, and wow. I would make myself go to bed. The fire was on me. And, and as Joe said earlier, you know, about, about sometimes God raised up uh, uh, specialists or people in that area. And I'm not calling myself a specialist, but uh, what really helped me accept it, because, uh, you know, as a young guy teaching the book of Revelation, people thought I was a weird guy. I had such a <laughs> desire for the end you times. Too. You mean that happened they thought to you I was too. crazy. They thought this guy <laughs> lost his mind. And I had such a desire to study prophecy. God showed me about the general practitioner as a doctor. And then God told me about the ear, nose, and throat doctors. And I said, okay, Lord, I understand that. He said, son, I call you to teach Bible prophecy. I'm not a Be pastor. Be a specialist in the field. Well, my area, my burden is to teach Bible prophecy. Okay. okay, let me ask you this. What are a couple of the greatest things God ever showed you, even up till this present time, that just absolutely transformed you that you think people should know? That, that, that God has everything under control. Now, that sounds so simple. Come on, preach. But let me tell you, God has everything under control. Everything that is taking place today, nothing has caught God off guard. And, and I'll give you one example. Even when Christ, even when Christ was in the garden and, and, and Judas uh, betrayed him with a kiss and, and Peter went forth uh, to, uh, to deliver Christ and, and Jesus said, put the sword away. You know, yeah. Jesus knew that he must die. It was already written in the scriptures. Yeah. Everything that happened to Christ was prophetic. Uh, and his, his manuscript was already written. His resume was already written in the Old Testament. And Christ fulfilled it to the T. 
Peter, put your sword away. I must go to the cross. It's been written that I do this. Again, nothing caught him off guard. And see, today, this is one reason why I challenge pastors that, you know, again, as, as Joe said earlier, if, if you don't have a burden to study prophecy, bring in a, a guy, a, a pastor, or bring in someone who can teach Bible prophecy because he has a burden for it. Bring him in and allow him to teach that message to give you a, a full balanced message of God's word. Yeah. Whether people believe it or not, whether they understand it or not, whether they like it or not, let me tell you this, we are in the end times. Wow. We are headed to an end time destination. Now, your question, Perry, you asked me, you know, uh, about it. Uh, it's a simple message. God has everything under control. Uh, some of the greatest things he showed me was that, that everything has an order. God has a divine order. You know, again, I, I'm one of those preachers that do believe in the rapture of the church. Right. I believe that the church is, is at hand to be raptured. It can happen at any moment. There's no signs, no indicators for that rapture. It can happen at any moment. But also I believe in the judgment seat of Christ. You know why? The scripture talks about we as Christians, Mm -hmm. You know, and this is a motivator for my life as a, as a minister mm -hmm. of the gospel. Yes, sir. You know, we that are raptured, we're going before the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible talks about a bema seat. It's a mm -hmm. seat. Uh, it's, a, it's a judgment for the redeemed. The Bible says that we Christians uh, that do a service for God here on earth we will obtain rewards. Man, that got me excited. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. God, God, God has an order. Not only that, then God talked about the tribulation. Once the church is removed, the seven-year tribulation. There's a coming time, Jesus said, it will be a time this world has never seen nor never ever will see again. A time of great tribulation. Not only that, yeah. he talked about the marriage supper of the Lamb. An event in the heavens, the Bible said, we would be with Christ uh, to be with him at this great banquet spread in heaven. Perry, when I found out there was food in heaven, I got excited. <laughs> I got excited. My wife says, my wife says there's going to be chocolate in heaven. Oh, it's going to be awesome. Chocolate We're going to have in a, heaven. You know there's chocolate in heaven. Well, I, I, I'm just, chocolate I'm so tree. excited. I'm going to have a chocolate tree at my mansion so my wife will be forced to come yes. and see me because she loves chocolate. <laughs> well, Perry, I'm so excited. <laughs> Revelation chapter 19 talks about the marriage banquet in heaven. Yes, sir. The sure Bible does. says blessed are those that are called, called to, to it. That. I mean, mm. now, now these are prophecy messages a lot of times we don't hear about. But right? the scripture, God so detailed the end times. He so yeah. beautifully placed it in the scriptures. God said, this is what I'm going to do, son. So. He's, he's got everything under control. Everything and under control. He has a divine order of divine events. Divine order Was of events. Was there something else that just has really gripped you over the years? Well, too? the nation of Israel. Uh, I'm so excited for what is happening in that region. You know, I'll give you another thing. In, in uh, Zechariah 12, the Bible says in the latter days that Jerusalem will become a, a cup of trembling yes, to the does. world and a burdensome stone. Yes. And the Bible says, uh, in essence, that when Jerusalem become that cup of trembling to the world, it, it's, it's like Jerusalem, uh, Israel has become a toothache to the world. You know, God says in the latter days that Israel would be unstable in the last days. You know that region today, we know there's no peace in Israel. Uh, one, reason, uh, is, one reason for that is because the scriptures has predicted in the end times it would be that way. God yeah. says it's like a cup of trembling. You ever had a cup of coffee in your hand trembling trying to drink it? You can't, well, it's unstable. You spill it. God says in the latter days Jerusalem would be that cup of trembling. It, it would be an unstable region to the world. Jerusalem will be on the lips of humanity. That's an indicator. That's a sign of the time. You know, it means that if you, if you put your hand on Listen, it, it's going to shake you up. Uh, not only that, but it's going to shake exactly, you up. Exactly. If you try to stabilize the cup, God has a warning. Now, let me share some prayer. This is amazing revelation about yeah. what's going on. Yeah. The unstableness of that region right now, and you got to hear this, is by God's design. Now, hear me. No man can stabilize that region. No government, no president, uh, no pastor, no one can stabilize that region but Jesus Christ. The king. And him alone. Now listen, the Bible wow. says in Psalms 122.6, the command from God is that we are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The Bible says you pray for the peace, peace of Jerusalem. Now when we pray that peace of Jerusalem, what we're literally praying, we're praying for another prophecy to come to pass. And that prophecy, mm -hmm. it comes right after the, the second coming of Christ. We come into the, the battle of Armageddon, and then we go into the millennial reign of Christ. It's a thousand-year reign of Christ <laughs> where Jesus, the Bible has predicted, will be on planet Earth for a thousand years to rule as king, uh, president, prime minister, potentate, head of state, whatever <laughs> you want to call him. He's going to rule like the world. Yes, sir. Not only that, but it's going to be a world and a kingdom without the devil. Oh, I like that part, too. Uh, it's amazing, Perry. The scripture predicts that there's going to be a thousand-year season of our Lord where Christ is going to rule. Now, the reason why he's going to do that, Perry, because it was prophesied in Isaiah 9 that Christ would sit on the throne of his father, David. Yes. 
We know when Christ came the first time, he rode into Jerusalem riding a donkey. That's a king. Zechariah said, hey, Israel, listen, your king is coming to you lowly riding up on a donkey. They said, hail, king of the Jews. They threw palm branches in front of him. And right. next few days, they said, give us Barabbas. They rejected him. Right. They had to because it was written in the scriptures. It was written. But this second time period, when Christ <laughs> come back, and he's coming back to set up his government. He's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords. My, my, come he's on. coming back as a ruler. Come and on. listen, when he comes back, and this is one reason why I love prophecy so much, because God gives us the end of the story. We're going to see Christ come and set up his millennial government. And what's so exciting for the redeemed, every one of us that are born again, we will be a part of that kingdom. Mm. The Bible wow. said we will rule and reign. Some of us will be in key positions all over the world to help Christ govern in the wow. end. Then it goes a little bit further. God's going to, again, judge the world at the end. The Bible even goes in depth to talk about the judgments of the world where Christ will judge the unredeemed. The mm -hmm. sinner will be, re he will be judged. Mm -hmm. uh, those have, who have rejected Christ, Revelation chapter 20, mm -hmm. verse 11 through 15, they will be judged by God. God's going to vindicate his judgment on the unredeemed. Out of all the messages I teach on Bible prophecy, the great white throne is one of those messages that have given me God's heartbeat mm. for, the, for the world. Wow. Pastor, this is one reason why you need to teach Bible prophecy or allow a prophecy teacher to come in and give the truth. This world is dying and they're going to hell. Listen, mm. Jesus died on Calvary's cross to redeem the lost. And you know, we take it for granted. We take for granted the price of what he did, what he gave, his life, it's his true. blood to redeem the world. Mm. And we have no value for the lost. Wow. I was preaching a few weeks in a, in a conference, and I, I said something I hadn't said before, and I was sharing with people about, about walking in forgiveness. And I was sharing that we're living in a time today that, listen, time is so short now, you don't have time not to forgive. Oh, Perry, wow. We're living in a time now. Well, that's powerful, man. I don't care what kind of grudge you have with a sister, a brother, a coworker, a family member. Listen, it is time to forgive and go after the harvest. Mm -mm -mm. It's sad, even in a church period, many Christians walk in unforgiveness. And I'm gonna tell you something tonight, listen, if you got a loved one that you, that you don't want, you, uh, you, they hurt you so bad that you can't forgive them, listen, it is time to let it go oh and go after the harvest because of the times. Unforgiveness is your distraction to keep you out of the harvest yes, field. Yes, you better believe it. And I tell you, this message of Bible prophecy, that's one reason why I love it. It's a motivator. Mm. This thing will keep the fire on So you. what do you, now there's a lot going on right now, but what do you see from your studies, projection? I, I know you can't always, the Holy Spirit has to give you the revelation yes. to know. But what do you see in, out there, uh, you know? Yeah, in, the, I, in, in, in the short, long term kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, I, I, well, I believe it's close. I can say that. I mean, uh, I, I would never make the mistake of, of setting a date. No, right. But let me tell you something, man. I, I'm, I'm looking up. I wake up in the morning looking up. You know, I, I, made, a, I made a statement that uh, I practice my rapture drills. <laughs> I jump up, my rapture drills. <laughs> I believe it is that close. Wow. I believe it's that close. Again, as the children of Issachar, these men had an ability to discern the times. Jesus right. rebuked his generation because they couldn't discern their visitation or the signs. Yes. All these indicators are right there in front of us. Give us a couple of them for people that may not be as familiar with, with it. Well, one, I got one, one in, in Peter. Second Peter talks about, and this is one that you don't hear about all the time. The Bible said in the latter days, latter days that there will be scoffers. And the scoffer would say, where is the promise of his, of his coming? Yeah. In other words, they said, since the fathers fell asleep, you know, you guys have been prophesying Jesus' return. Ah, he's not coming back. And people say that. People say that. Christian people Christian say people that. Christian people say yeah. This is a scoffer. This is a scoffer. We have scoffers even in the church. And it's sad to, sad to say that, but we do. They say, where is the promise? You guys have been prophesying this stuff for so long. Mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you something. With all these indicators, Israel back in the land, uh, wars and rumors of wars, famines. Uh, they have terms now, period called mega famines. Let me ask you something. How do we have famines in the 21st century. We have technology that we can, put, we can put equipment anywhere in the world to get rid of famine. But Jesus said in the latter days that there would be famines as an indicator of his return. Mm -hmm. We still have famine. They're using terms today, mega famines. Mm. There are so many indicators. But again, I always go back to Israel because Israel is that, is that mega sign. Mm -hmm. It's major. With all the things that are happening right now, you know, everybody wants to stabilize that cup. I made a statement from pulpits across the country. It is very dangerous for America to try to stabilize that cup. 
Mm -hmm. You know, I've said this. I mean, uh, every president that we have had, uh, starting with Carter, have uh, grabbed a hold of that cup to stabilize Jerusalem. And all it, all it did for them was, was make it a, a photo op. That's all it was, because mm -hmm. before, the, the, uh, before the ink dried, uh, they broke the contract. Right. You listen, no one can stabilize that region but the Prince of Peace. Wow. And listen, this is the command from God that we, the church, we must, we must pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You pray that prayer, you're praying for the Lord to come back. And you know, it also says, if you, amen. It also says there, they shall prosper that, that love, love thee. thee. Now, if we don't love the, the city, yes. love the people, love the land, because yes. it's covenant. You yes, see, yes. it's all about covenant. Yes. See, I, I think sometimes secular leaders don't understand that America's link with Israel is covenant. Yes, it is. It's not politics, and it's not political. Now, here's you another danger. You can't mess with the covenant. Here's another danger, Perry. We have a rise in our times of replacement theology. Yes. Where many have today have believed that the church has absolutely replaced Israel that is dangerous. We can't do it. Again, it's covenant. Yeah. Ezekiel 5.5 5 says that Jerusalem is, is the center of the nations. Yes. Most scholars call Jerusalem the navel of the planet. Yeah. Listen, God says that little land, that little piece of real estate is on my heart. Wow. God loves Jerusalem. Praise God. Out, out, out of all the land, God said that little piece of real estate is mine. We call it what? The promised land? What does that mean? It's, it's land that has been promised. promised. We take that for granted. But listen, this is prophecy. I've said many times, if God does not fulfill the prophecies that he's made toward the land of Israel, we might as well throw this Bible away. It's true. You know, God said in the scripture, in the Psalms, he said, if you can stop the ordinance of the sun, moon, and stars, <laughs> there'll be no land of Israel. Perry, I woke up this morning, the, the sun rose with me this yes, morning. Yes, it did. As I saw that sun, I said, mm -hmm. okay, Israel's going to be here because God said it. Yes. And let me tell you something, we're living in amazing times. I'm excited about these times. I talk to pastors across the country. I, I try to ignite these guys. I try to get them exciting. I have some pastors, Perry, that say, well, Brother Perkins, I'll be honest with you. I really don't have a burden for Bible prophecy. That's why I bring you in. I, oh, got, pastors, wow. I got pastors that bring us in every year. I got one pastor. We, we're about to celebrate 20 years of consecutive. Every year? Every 20, it's a 20 oh. year going in. And it's so exciting. I got some wow. pastors that bring us in every year. But, you know, but I thank I, God the pastor, that's what Joe was saying. If, yes. you, if you don't feel the call, the burden of the knowledge, bring somebody. Yes. Yeah. Well, the apostle Paul, he warned the church. He said, he said uh, Paul said he, he did not uh, uh, shun or stop to give you the whole counsel of God. Mm, I like See, a that. lot of times, you know, we just want, you know, Genesis, the Psalms, and, and, yeah. and, and the, the, the Gospels. Give me the feel-good verse. But you don't want to go <laughs> to the end of the story. Yeah. You know, and again, a lot of times people stay out of Revelation or the book of Revelation because all of the, the tribulation things. Now, there are some doom and gloom there, I will admit, but that doom and gloom is not for the redeemed. If you're born again, that's a, that's if you're born again, here. it is not for you. But I'll say this, as the redeemed, you need to be about God's business reaching right. the lost. Right. It is our, because we understand where we are, Perry, because we understand yes. that we're living in the last days, yes. Yes. we need to be about our Father's business reaching the harvest. I want to, Don, let me just say, I want to say, and I know this congregation feels the same way as an African American brother, I appreciate the stand you take for the Word and for Bible prophecy. Uh, to God be the You're glory. one of those great, great teachers. He, he really is. Perry, it's his burden. When God put a burden in my heart, as I share with you, my whole life changed. You know, wow. I, have a, I, have a, I have a ring here that has a bunch of Star Davids on it. And for, for a black man to have a Star David ring on his hand is amazing. <laughs> but you're, let me tell you think son, you're Ethiopian, yeah, yeah, well, I, I've, I've had that said. <laughs> but I'll tell you this. When God, I couldn't resist that. When God burdened my heart yes. and he began to teach me Bible prophecy, as I studied the Word of God, I saw Israel. Yes, sir. And it went into my heart. That's and I began to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, that God would come back, you know, our Savior would come back. Yes. Well, so, I, I want to say, uh, for you who are watching on the TBN family, Donald has a number. Are, are these CDs or DVDs? Those DVD, are DVDs All there. DVDs here. Yes. Israel and Prophecy, The Battle of Armageddon. These sound very interesting. And this is Jerusalem, A Cup of Trembling, the newest one. Is yeah, that right? That's right. All right. There's the information of, on his website that you can get this material, order this material. And, uh, Donald, what a privilege it is to see you and have you on TBN again. And I want to just say to the... TV and audience to be sure and get on John Donald's website. It'll be a blessing to you. Also, coming up in a moment, I'll just flash this here. The Harbinger, uh, the rabbi that wrote that, is on TBN coming up next. Now, folks, listen to me. I want you to get on the phone right now while Larry and Gene is singing What a Savior. 
I want you to call everybody you know because you're about to hear directly from the man who wrote this uh, book that's in the top 10 New York bestsellers right now. This is absolutely phenomenal, and we're just going to turn him loose in a few moments. Larry and Gina, what a Savior. Thank you, Donald. God bless you.
tremendous singing. Thank you, Larry and Gina Bean. Uh, for those of you who have watched the Manifest telecast on TBN and the Church Channel, we've completed Breaking the Apocalypse Code. I want to mention it one more time this evening before we introduce our next guest. It has uh, seven DVDs, 14 hours of teaching with the study syllabus, a 109-page syllabus, and a beautiful album. And uh, if you really want to understand the book of Revelation and you want to see the pictures and the scriptures come on the screen, it's all here. I've worked three years on this. Hallelujah, it's finished. <laughs> I was so relieved. You have no idea how happy I was. Now, you have probably seen or heard of this book called The Harbinger. With me today is Rabbi Jonathan um, Kahn, pastor and messianic rabbi of Jerusalem Center, Beth Israel in Wayne, New Jersey, which is made up of both Jews and Gentiles, believed to be the largest messianic congregation in the United States, founder of Hope for the World Missions, a ministry which is a mission to spread the gospel of salvation through the world by television, uh, Bible distribution, radio broadcast, etc. And the book, I, I've just got to, I'm just got to turn him loose and let him uh, share with you first time on TBN a man whose book is literally sweeping the country like wildfire, The Harbinger. Would you welcome for the first time to TBN, Rabbi Jonathan Cunt. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. sir. Good to have you. Great to be All here. All right. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just turn you loose because they want to hear from you. Tell us about the book. What has God spoke to you? What is in it that is changing the voice of America and the heartbeat okay. of America right now? The Harbinger is the revealing of an ancient mystery that holds the secret of America's future. It is a two and a half thousand year old mystery that lies behind everything from 9-11 to the war on terror, to the economic collapse, to the crashes of Wall Street, to the Great Recession, to really everything that's happening right now goes back two and a half thousand years in the Bible and is so specific that it even ordains, foretells, determines the actions of American leaders, the words that come out of their mouths, the actual dates and days and hours of the crashes of Wall Street uh, affects everyone's pocketbook, everyone's future. Um, and it concerns specifically nine harbingers. It begins with nine harbingers. Now explain or, what a harbinger is for someone who's not yeah, familiar. Yeah, a harbinger is a foreshadow or, an, okay. or a kind of a, a prophetic sign of what's going to happen. And in the last days of ancient Israel, uh, before it was destroyed in judgment, nine harbingers appear in the land. And the, the, here is the eerie thing or the, the scary thing. The same nine harbingers are now reappearing on another nation's soil in America. Mm. The same nine harbingers, not generally, exactly, precisely, um, and some uh, take the form of symbolic objects, some take the form of events or reenactments, uh, some appear in New York City, some appear in Washington, D.C., some involve the highest leaders of the land. They are specific, they're precise, uh, and they ultimately each one holds a prophetic message about the future of America and a message as God calling and God warning a nation that is in danger of judgment. Is this the principle in Ecclesiastes, that which has been is that what shall be? It is, is, that, it, is that the principle it, it, it we're is, talking about it, here? it is in this case, yeah. And, and not just generally, exactly. I mean, precisely. Um, to set the stage, yeah. uh, two and a half thousand years ago, you had Israel, uh, the northern kingdom. Israel was a nation that had originally known God, was established by God, set by his word. Uh, but then they turned away from him. And they, they went into sexual immorality. They drove him out of their government, drove him out of their land. They offered up their children as sacrifices. And he called to them. He sent prophets them. And finally, mm -hmm. he allowed something to happen. And this is the first harbinger, the first warning sign. And this is a pattern of the judgment of a nation. It happened also with Judah. And th the first harbinger is the breach. And what happens is he allows the hedge of protection that he put around that nation to be removed. And he allows it to be removed temporarily. It's first just, it's a temporary thing. He allows a strike, an enemy to make a strike into the land. It is contained, it is limited, and then it's all over. It was a wake-up call. It was a call to that nation that it would not be destroyed because ultimately they're going to turn away from God and they are going to be destroyed. But he first warns them. He did it with Judah too. First, it's a temporary strike. And so their, their reaction, and it's the only thing that's going to reach them now is something of this severity, but their reaction, instead of repenting or being humbled, they, wow. say, they defy him and they make a vow. And that vow is recorded in Isaiah, Isaiah okay. 9, verse 10, which is the decoder of the harbingers. Okay. And it comes with this vow. And what they say is, 
in this attack. The bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with hewn stone. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will plant cedars in their place. In other words, what they're saying is, we, God, you're not going to humble us. We're not coming back to you. We are gonna, we're going to defy you, and we're going to even come back stronger against you than ever. We're going to rise stronger than ever. And so this is, the, this is the vow, and in that vow is the decoder of the nine harbingers. And what happens is because they make that vow, it's ominous. They set the course for judgment. And what's going to happen is all the harbingers of warning are going to appear, and ultimately Israel is going to be wiped off the face of the earth. Now, that's what happened to ancient Israel. What does it have to do with America? Yeah. Well, now America is the nation that was also founded for God. It was also established for his word. It was actually established to be a new Israel, as you that, know. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so we, we set that pattern. And so and America has been the most blessed nation on earth because of it, as much as we followed God, as much as we blessed Israel, as much right. as we, we spread the gospel. But now America, and it's clear to any, any true believer with a, with a sensitivity to the Lord, is that America is now the nation that's turning away from God. Rapidly, yeah. rapidly. And so and it's, it's driving him out of its government, driving him out of its life, offering up its children in abortion. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, I mean, Israel yes, offered sir. up thousands. America's offered up millions. Uh, it, it, is, it, is, it is embracing sexual immorality and all, just what Israel did. So what happens? Finally, finally, God, after calling a growing deaf to God's ears, he allows the first harbinger, which is the breach. He allows America's hedge of protection to be removed. It happens on September 11th, 2001. It is a temporary, it is a removal. He allows an enemy to make a strike and, and right. temporary, limited, contained, but to wake up, to a shake up. And, a lot, and so many believers felt this in their heart. A wake up call, but America does not wake up. And here's the problem. I mean, initially, there was a, people were flocking to churches for right. about three weeks. And, that, yeah, and, and it, was a, it was a shadow of what could have been a national revival. Right. But without repentance, without a change of course, you, you cannot have revival. They got so, political instead of repented. Exactly, exactly. Patriotic, so, patriotic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, that, that goes right with this mystery, because that's what happened to ancient Israel. They did the wow. same thing. So what happened is America instead responds exactly as ancient Israel did, and, it, and, so, and it's an ominous thing, and so it sets in motion these now appearances of the harbingers. And I'll give you, you know, there's so much, there's so much in this. I'll just, I could just, we could just touch on it tonight, yeah. but I'll just touch on some of them. Yeah. Then, you know, uh, first of all, one of them, in ancient Israel, I will call the, the stone of judgment. What happens, and you can just follow that vow that Isaiah recorded. They say, Say the bricks have fallen, but we're going to replace them with hewn stone. So what they're saying is we're going to build stronger, bigger, better. Without any repentance, God, we're coming back stronger. So what happens is they, they go to the quarries of Israel. The, the Hebrew word is gazit, gazit stone. It means a cut quarried stone. They go to the quarries. They cut this massive rectangular block of stone. They bring it to where the bricks have fallen, and they vow we're going to build now stronger than the bricks. We're coming back stronger than ever. What does this have to do with anything? Well, with America, this is the fifth harbinger. For for this to appear, America would have to cut out a gazit stone, this, this rec big rectangular block, and do the same thing. So what happens after 9-11, People in New York, something happens at a mountain upstate New York. They go up, they quarry out this massive stone. This literally happened. Yes, literally happened. This gazit stone, it's a biblical gazit stone, 20 tons of rectangular block. They have to br they bring it back to New York. They bring it to lower Manhattan. They have to bring it to where the bricks have fallen. They bring it to ground zero. They lower it on the pavement, and they, ha they, they have leader. They have a ceremony around the, around the, the, the stone. They call it the, the freedom stone. They have, they have American leaders vowing over it, saying, we're Going to come back stronger, bigger than ever. They have no idea they're reenacting an ancient judgment oh, wow. drama. And oh wow! You go right down the right down Isaiah. It's a quote. He, go, he says. Then the next verse is the sycamores have been cut down. Well, what happened is when the attack came on Israel, they cut down. The enemy destroyed the sycamore trees. Now yeah. the uprooting of a tree or the cutting of a tree is a biblical sign of judgment. God uses the picture yes, again. Yes, that's again. true. Right. A sycamore is actually also a national sign of judgment. The falling down of the sycamore. God is warning them. I'm going to uproot you if you do not turn back. You're going to be like you're this tree I planted, but you're going to be uprooted. What does this have to do with America? Because this symbol, this, this sixth harbinger, would have to be a sycamore. The sign of the sycamore has to appear somehow linked to 9-11. Well, New York is not a place you go looking for agriculture, first of all. That's and, right. And the terrorists were not interested in any of this. They didn't know any of this. What happened is an eerie thing happens. In the last moments of 9-11, as the last tower is coming down, it sends forth a beam, and it goes across and strikes an object that just happens to be standing there at the 
the corner, that object happens to be a tree, and the tree happens to be the sycamore. The oh. sycamore is fallen. And so it's the, the ancient sign of national judgment, the people of New York, they take the sycamore, they put it on display, they make it a symbol, they call it the sycamore of ground zero. They think it's a good thing. People go around, they have no idea. This is the symbol of national uprooting, the sixth harbinger. I'll, I'll touch on the, wow. another, the seventh harbinger. It says the sycamores have been cut down, and the verse goes on, but we will plant cedars in their place. And what they're this, saying, I, the prophet says this now. Yeah, the prophet is... About Israel's he, judgment. He's quoting the, the leaders of Israel who are making this vow of arrogance. God says, you're doing this in arrogance, you're defying me. So here's another symbol. They say, okay, God, you may have allowed the sycamore to be struck down, but we are going to take a stronger tree, the cedar, and we're going to do this, this kind of ceremony. We're going to take this, we're going to plant it exactly where the fallen tree had stood, the sycamore, but this this is going to be a stronger one. So they do this as an act of defiance. And so what could this have to do with America for the seventh harbinger to appear? What happens is three years or two and a half years after 9-11, a tree appears in the sky over ground zero. It is being lowered by this crane. They lower it down into this soil. First of all, what kind of trees? Well, let me just say the, the word in, in Hebrew, in English we get, we have the word cedar, but of course they didn't speak English. They right. spoke Hebrew. The word is erez or erez tree. It means, it can mean a cedar. It also means a, it means literally an evergreen conifer panacea tree or pine tree. That's the best actually definition. So what happens is they lower this tree into the earth on ground zero. What tree is it? It's not a sycamore. The tree is a conifer, a panacea tree, the biblical Erez tree of Isaiah 9:10, And where do they lower it? They lower it into the exact spot where the sycamore had stood. And they do the actual Hebrew act. They have a ceremony around the tree. They call it the tree of hope. And they vow these, you know, this is, this is a sign of, of human will and confidence. And they have no idea. Nobody's planning this. I don't want to say, nobody's trying to do this. Right. It's just the harbingers are manifesting. Now, the, now it gets even more, more eerie. And that is that Mm. The, the next harbinger, the eighth harbinger, is the vow itself. In ancient Israel, they said the vow. Isaiah records it. But who would have said it? The people could have said it, but the leaders had to have said it for it to be right. prophetically significant. Right. They represent the nation, and right. they are setting the course. So for this to happen, the leaders would have been in Samaria. That's the capital city. So here for this harbinger, this was what would have to happen, the harbinger of the utterance or the vow. A leader of the land would have to vow this vow of defiance linked to 9-11 and in some way, and it would have to be done in the capital city as a public statement, a public vow. So could this happen? What American leader in the right mind is going to pronounce a pronouncement really of judgment on the nation? That's what right. it is. It's identifying, right. uh, it would be identifying America with a nation under judgment. So the amazing thing is, three years after 9-11, on the actual anniversary of 9-11, an American leader comes in Washington, D.C., a gathering, a caucus. He's, the, he's a Democrat uh, uh, vice presidential candidate. It was John Edwards. And he, he's there standing oh. in this assembly, and he says, on this anniversary, we have this word. And then he says, the bricks have fallen, but we will, we will rebuild what? with hewn stone. Or he quotes he, Isaiah? He, he vows the actual word for word, the oh, ancient my. vow of judgment. He vows it word for word. He doesn't know what he's doing, and he has no idea. He thinks he's giving an inspirational speech. Right, he has no right. idea, but the harbingers have to manifest. My, he says this, my. and the, 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 as he says it, he says, we're going to do this. And, and then he, he builds, not only that, he builds his entire speech around that ancient vow. He goes on saying, we're going to put up the cedars. We're going to do the sycamore. We're going to do all these things. And he has no idea what he's doing, but he, the wow. vow of he's pronouncing judgment on America, and it is identifying America as the nation in its stages, later stages of danger and judgment. And that's not all, because there's, there's another one, and this, mm. and, and this is, that is, that the, the, the ninth harbinger is the harbinger of the prophecy. It's the vow spoken prophetically in this, in this way. They said the vow, but then the prophet records it. It becomes a prophetic word. It becomes part of the national record of Israel. And they also say it, they say, we're going to do this before they do it. It's going to happen. Everything they vow is going to happen. So they had to say it sometime after the attack. So could this have happened sometime around the time of 9-11, an American leader saying it, saying it as it's about to happen? Well, the, the eerie thing is, it happens. 
On the day after 9-11, the very day after, the morning after, we were all in, in shock. We, we missed it. What happened is mm. on that day, the government gathers on Capitol Hill. Yeah. It, is, it is the Congress. They're going to make the state. America's going to make its response to 9-11. And so it's going to be very significant. The man chosen to do that is the Senate Majority Leader. He represents the Senate. The Senate represents the nation. He's right. in position. And the man, is, the man is Tom Daschle. He comes up to the, to the Senate floor. Everybody's waiting. The Congress is there. And what he says, he, he, he presents. America's response, and at the end of his speech, he, clo he reaches the finale by saying this, there is a word from Isaiah that I think speaks to all of us at times like this. And then, he, then from Capitol Hill, it, the word goes forth, he says, the bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with dress stone. Oh, wow. the, 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 it's fallen, he, he goes on, and then he says, this is what we, America, will do. He's saying America is going to follow the course of ancient Israel mm. of judgment. He doesn't know. He, he doesn't mean. They it. don't know the judgment no. part. See, he, they're he, not getting that, are they? That he that's think, connected. He, he thinks it's a word of inspiration. He says right. this is a word of inspiration. He has no idea what he's doing, but he's setting the course, and this is going to set the course to, for the second stage of. And this is in the, the harbinger is kind of in two parts. The second stage is the second stage of judgment, which is the second shaking, and this is this opens up a whole other realm of mysteries, and it and it sets the stage. And actually, I'll tell you, when when Tom Daschle says it, it's actually actually prophetic. He doesn't know what he's doing. But right. like, and I'm not, I'm not speaking about the man or anything. Absolutely. It's not about the man. No, it's but not about Caiaphas, the man. Right. he did the same thing. You know? Right. And so, because he was in position because of his office. Same with, same with this one. Right. So he says, so he's actually saying, these prophets, he's saying, he's saying, he says the bricks have fallen. He says the, the, sick, the tree has been cut down. He speaks of the tree that's cut down. He doesn't even realize there is an actual tree that day they just discovered. He, he says the stone's going to go up. He doesn't realize three years later the stone is actually going to go up. Yeah. He speaks of the replacement of the other tree. He doesn't realize it's all going to happen, and it's going to happen as he says it. Years, year, what's going to happen here? He, this, is the, this is the next part of the mystery. We're still in it. It's affecting everything right now. And that is that it, you look at the commentaries on this part of, of Israel's history, and what they say about Isaiah 9 10 is that because Israel rejected this warning from God, they would, this first calamity, it's going to bring a second calamity on the nation. So this is the second part now. So what you're saying here is that we've seen the fulfillment of an ancient parallel yes. from Isaiah in our day. Yes, exactly. But now if we follow through with what Isaiah says further, okay. we're about to go there. Is exactly. that right? Is that what you're saying? It, it is exactly. And, and, it, and the interesting thing is that, that here it's Isaiah 9.10 is the vow. The next verse that begins the judgment is called Isaiah 9:11. Interesting, you know, because that's the thing, and that uh -oh. leads into that leads into the rest. And My so, hair just stood up when you said that. Good gracious! And so, 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 wow. things, so, so, it, so that that means there's going to be something else that's going to happen. The first shaking, and these are really the, the biggest events of the last ten years. The first shaking, it strikes buildings, it strikes the land. Okay. But the second shaking is going to strike the very power of America itself, and that is the very power of the American economy, the American finance, it's going to be, right. it's going to collapse. And, and the thing is, and it's going to be, that also is going to be linked to this ancient mystery. And in fact, the American government would, would take a fateful act, and we won't have time to go into it, but they would make a decision that would cause the whole collapse, and they would do it, it turned out, on the anniversary of the day the vow was proclaimed on Capitol Hill of defiance, on the, the, the anniversary. And so, so there, there wow. are mysteries here. One, and we, I'll just, just barely mention some, and then we'll, we'll touch on, on yeah. one one. Okay. And one is, one is in, in the book, is the, it's called the Isaiah 9-10 effect, that everything that's happening right now goes back to this ancient mystery in Isaiah and from the dust of 9-11 is actually causing everything that's happening. I mean, from that day of 9-11. Right. The, the economy, everything. The, another one is called, is called the, the three witnesses, and that is that there's the principle of three wit two or three witnesses to a matter of judgment. Right. Well, there has actually been th been three witnesses to the matter of America's judgment who have who have stood up I mean, and not knowing what they're doing. And I won't go into detail except we can't sure. we don't sure. have time. But except that the last one goes up to the White House itself. And the, the, the next one, the next one is called the, you know, the mystery of the uprooted, that there was a sign when America began its rise as financial superpower of the world. There was a sign on that day given, a prophetic sign. That sign reappears on 9-11, and now in a different form that foreshadows the fall of the American superpower. Mm. Now, the one I'll we'll touch a little bit is called the mystery of the Shemitah. And that is, and, you, and you, you know about it, you know, certainly under one form, and that is that every seven years, Israel had a rest, yeah, Sabbath sure rest. Yeah. And so everything came to a standstill, buying, selling, all that. The economy came to a standstill. And so on the very last day 
all debts had to be wiped away. On the last day of that seventh year, all debts, yes. all credit wiped away. And the nation's financial accounts are wiped clean. Now, this would be a good thing, except that what the problem was, as Israel turned away from God, they stopped doing this, and they, they drove God out of their life. They, they pursued money and gain ahead of it. And so what happens is the yeah. Shemitah is going to come back, the Sabbath is going to come back as a sign of judgment. And so when they're taken cap into captivity, the sign of how long they're being captivity was the sign of the Shemitah. That's so right. Like, so what does this have to do with America? And let me just say one thing. The day that this would all come crashing down, the, the wiping out of the nation's financial accounts, was the 29th day of the Hebrew month of Elul, Elul 29. Okay. America. Now, America is not under the law to do this. However, as a prophetic sign, the Shemitah becomes a sign against a nation that has driven God out of its life, right. that has pursued gain and money ahead of God, right. and it's the, the, it is the sign that specifically touches the financial realm of a nation, okay, and wipes it clean. The key is seven years, seven years. We're talking about the yeah. first shaking, 9-11, second shaking collapse. When did they happen? First one is 2001, second one 2008, 2008. happens seven years apart. Yeah. To when did, the, when did the collapse happen? In September. That is seven years to the, to the month of 9-11. When? To the second week of September, seven years to the week of 9-11. In fact, when America is commemorating 9-11, the second shaking is being set in motion on Wall Street. And it goes, yeah. it goes deeper. And, and if you go, what was the biggest, greatest day of the collapse? It happened at the end of September. It was the greatest stock market crash in That's Wall right. Street history. If you remember, a strange thing happened at the, that day when they rang the bell that wouldn't ring. The, the Wall Street bell refused to ring. They took yeah. it as an omen. What happened is it crashes, it crashes over 700 points, greatest crash in Wall Street history. When did it take place? It took place on the 29th day of Elul, the day appointed to wipe away a nation's financial accounts, yeah. a day of judgment against a nation that has driven God out of its life, and all that on that day, and what, what, what happened? It was a Shemitah. It was yeah. the wiping away of credit, wiping away of debt, wiping away of stock market, all that, and it spreads. And then if you go back seven years, it's a seven-year mystery, go back seven years, and you find in September of 2001, it wasn't only 9-11, it was the other greatest crash in American history. And when did that stock market crash take place? On the 29th day of Elul, the exact same day appointed for judgment. The two greatest crashes up to that day, up to those yeah. days, happened on the Hebrew day appointed for the judgment of a nation's financial realm exactly seven years apart. Do you remember the numbers, if I'm not mistaken, it yes. was 777, the stock market The mystery crash, of sevens. And gold went up to 888. Yes, yes. Go you're like a trial. You're in a trial as gold is yeah. tried in the fire. 888 is the number of Jesus in Greek. Yeah. Yeah. Lord Jesus yes, Christ. It is. In Greek. Yes, and you just pointed something. It's a mystery of seven. Remember what, what the Shemitah is about seven. It's about seven. So, so that whole day is marked with seven. How much, how much was wiped out? Seven percent was wiped That's out. That's right. On the seventh day, seven seven sevens wiped out. So it's so much we can barely touch up. But, <laughs> but let me try to let me try to do one. Just get one yeah, more yeah, in there because yeah. we just touch on, on the things that are in there. But here's one thing because it's going to bring it home, and that is this: there is a principle in Scripture that that it happens when Solomon and gathers the nation to is to the Temple Mount. The nation is complete, got a temple. He dedicates it to God. They, they pray, they dedicate Israel to God, the Temple Mount, all that. He speaks about the future generations that they fall away, all this prophetic, they pray. Now, could there be a parallel in, in well, before that, he says this, so the, the, the dedication ground is the Temple Mount, that's a consecration ground. Mm -hmm. But years later, when Israel totally rejects God, the, the judgment or the calamity is going to come back to that Temple Mount ground. It's going to, it's going to destroy the temple, and, and it's a principle that the judgment or the, or the calamity comes back to the nation's ground of consecration or dedication. Mm. And so, what could this have to do with America? Wow. The America, the first, America's first day as a nation was in New York City. Well, actually, the first day was Washington is inaugurated as president, and that's in 1789. That's April 30th. And so, and it's, it parallels. It's a day of prayer. It's, America, it's America's first day as a fully formed nation. Washington actually gives a prophetic warning warning on that day, we can't go into it, but about if America ever turns away from God. And he, he gives this warning, then he leads the government on foot to a place to pray and dedicate the government and America to God. They go to a little stone chapel. If we can find out where that is, we will identify the nation's mystery ground here. So where was it? The first capital of mm -hmm. America wasn't Washington, D.C., wasn't yep. Philadelphia, it was New York City. That's right. And where? It was in Lower Manhattan. Where did they go to dedicate America to God? Where is America's consecration ground? It is the corner of ground zero. America was yeah. consecrated to God at ground zero. In fact, ground zero was part of the church land. It is ground zero. Yeah. And, and on that day, on that day, that's the same ground 
where the sycamore, the, the harbingers manifest. The sycamore grew on that America's consecration ground. And so the, all the things took place there. And on the day of, of, of that, of 9-11, a shockwave goes forth from ground zero, the consecration ground, strikes this other place, Federal Hall, where Washington was sworn in and gave that prophetic warning, mm -hmm. cracks the foundation of America there. Mm. And the one place that uh, on, on ground zero that was not destroyed or badly uh, charred was this the place, that little stone chapel where they dedicated America to God. And the reason why they say was because uh, the, something blocked the force. It was the harbinger. It was the sixth harbinger. The sycamore mm. is what saved it. So the point of the harbingers mm. and the point of the harbinger of the book, and I believe it's for this time, is not to it's not that America be destroyed, that America be saved. That's yes, the point. Yes, That's yes. the point. And there's so much we can't go into, but one yeah. thing I want to say is that after Solomon prayed that prayer, God gave him an answer to that prayer. If the, if, if the nation turns away from God, that's the word now. God said to him, if my people who are called by Listen my name this is will the humble key. themselves and this is the turn key. from their yeah, evil yeah. ways, seek by my God, face and pray, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their Thank land. You, Lord. If my people. So that the ultimate thing is their hope, yes, but it's, it's in my people. We say we want revival, but it's if my people, we need revival. We are the my ones Lord. who have to be the lights. We are the ones who have to spread the word. We have to start living it. We have to put away anything that has to be put away and put on whatever we have to put on. If this my is the God. time. The time is late. And the time is my now. Lord. If my people, you know, if uh, if I'm if I'm correct in this, but there was Trade Center one and two, then Trade Center three, four, five, six, seven. There was a total of seven buildings directly with Trade Center, the yes. Trade Center compound yes. effect. Yes. Yes. This number seven keeps coming up. Yes, it does. It does. It does. It does. And there's so up. much. Yeah. It even there is even there is even a mystery. I we can't go into for this. There's a mystery with if you take the number the seven 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 of that that moment that four o'clock stock market close. Right. And you go back seven days. Uh, you go seven years, and then to the seventh day and seven hours, it takes you not only to the crash before, it takes you to the day of 9-11, and it even takes you to the hour of 9-11, even the hour of it. Why do you think, now, I, you know me enough to know that we study Hebrew roots, we yes. study cycles, patterns, types, yes. and shadows. Why does it work? Now, you're a rabbi. Your explanation of why does, how, why can we go to the Old Testament and find it repeated Modern history. Well, it, you know, God, it says these these things are for our examples. Yeah. So in, in every Paul every that, every yeah. possible way, the principles are, are real. God is still the same God, and and right. He's still He's still He's still just and He's still merciful. And and America was founded especially to be a new Israel. So so we were blessed right. as Israel was blessed. But now if we're turning away from those blessings, that's it. We're going through the same exact pattern. That's it. It's amazing. It's the same exact pattern. So I believe, and I believe it is for now. I believe. I mean, we you know our ministry is located not far from 9/11. My wife. Was supposed to be there at be at that pl at that time, but oh, she, her wow. schedule was changed. We had people who were in the building who got out, and we know others. So so it was very much on our heart. And when that when that happened, I prayed, Lord, I know this is. We all felt it. There's something very significant here for the future. And that's when I started being led to this this passage of what was happening in Israel. I didn't I didn't realize where it was going to go. Later on, I was standing at the corner of Ground Zero, and I saw that tree, and and and, mm. it, and it said, Follow that. And it kept on getting wow. bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it just became this this mind-boggling thing. I found out later that David Wilkerson, Times Square Church, yeah. when this thing happened the next week, he didn't see all these harbingers like that, but he got it, he said directly from the Lord, he said, the word for America now is Isaiah 9, and he said Isaiah 9, 10. He even said that, that thing mm. there. So, so he, he, that's the thing, and I, I have no question wow. that is for now such a time as this. I don't believe, I don't take any credit for this thing. I mean, what's happening, I, 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 I can tell you this, I've never read a, wrote a book before, but this just, <laughs> this, this just, it just flowed out. I mean, it flowed out and fast. It was it a just, God it, book. Just, it just flowed out, and, and uh, yeah, so, so I believe it's for such a time as this, and not only for the saved, but also for the unsaved. Uh, I'm hearing about yeah. people getting saved. Yeah. I'm hearing, you know, and for revival. That's the point. I want to tell you this. You wrote it like a novel to get the attention for the unsaved person. Yeah, not The harbingers yeah. are all in here, like he's talking about, but he writes it with a conversation. It, yeah, it is. It it's is. not your normal. Yeah. yeah. I like the way you did that. <laughs> I, believe, I, I wrote, originally wrote it straight out, and then, the, then I got, I believe it from the yeah. Lord. It was 90% uh, of it is the revelation, but in order to deliver, God uses uh, story stories, symbols. That's exactly so I used right. a, a figure of a prophet giving this to another man and with through nine seals. So it's so, so that it's that hopefully it's hard to put down. That's it holds hearing. the attention yeah. of a person. Yeah. More than just fact, fact, yeah. fact. But the fact is here. Yeah, oh the total now, thing's that. 
Tell them how to get the book. Do you have a website? Yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all, you can get the book anywhere. Anywhere. It's on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, Walmart, CBD. It's all, it's everywhere. You can get it. You don't have to get it from me. Um, you get it and then uh, the, the other thing is that um, if they want more, they want the teachings behind it or the full thing. We have DVDs right. and we have the images of the Harbingers. Uh, we have a, a website called theharbingerwebsite.com or theharbingerwebsite.org. Our ministry is hopeoftheworld.com or hopeoftheworld.org. And, and the other thing is they just did a, a, a documentary, a DVD documentary called the Isaiah 910 Judge. It's really powerful, and you can get that on Amazon.com. Okay. So. You know, it's amazing because uh, you mentioned Amazon. Our books are connected to yours. Yes. Have you noticed that? Yes, I did. Like my book's right beside his. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. No, 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 no. No, no. Because he's, no, uh, he's no. in the top ten. I ain't made it there. No, no, my honor. But, but I'm, saying, honor. I'm saying that jokingly, but uh, at the same time, I, I, it's, it's a blessing because when I. Uh, the, the people are sending me this, and they're really? saying, you got to read it. I said, well, I've already gone through it. <laughs> but it's, it's fascinating because. I love Hebraic root study. Yes, you know yes. that from our ministry. First time I've met you, but I have partners of mine in Cleveland who are partners of yours. Oh, okay. And so they've been telling me about you for quite some time. And folks, I want to tell you something. This is a word from the Lord for America. And I don't, I don't want you to miss what the rabbi said. In the next minute we have, I don't want you to miss this. He said it's important for America to repent. I said this on 9-11, we became mm. very, very uh, patriotic, mm. but no repentance. We mm. flew the flag. Mm. We felt good about America. Let's go get them, mm. but no repentance. And repentance means to, not just to say you're sorry, but it means to turn. So if you're watching yes. and you are away from God, if you're a backslider, we've been talking about the last days. I want you to go to the telephone and call and have someone pray for you right now that they can lead you back to a relationship with Christ. Or if you've never had a relationship with Christ, please do it right now. Now, I'm going to be coming back after Larry and Gina sing, He Ain't Never Done Me Nothing But Good. What a song. And I want you to stay with me for about the next 16 minutes, 17 minutes or so. I have a word that's going to flow with this word from a different perspective about America. Please tell someone to tune in. It's coming right up. Larry and Gina Bean, he ain't never done me nothing but good. Let's give Rabbi a hand for being with us. What a word. Hallelujah. What a word.
To follow up on this prophetic night, I want to share with you a word from the book of Nehemiah. The Bible says, the thing which has been is that which shall be. And we're going to show you a parallel of Nehemiah's time to the day and time in which we're living in. When the Jews returned back to Israel to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, they were being distracted by a group of Samaritans who were attempting to hinder their work. Distraction is from a word distract, which means to throw you off track. A distraction is intended to throw you off track. Nehemiah was building, notice chapter 4, the strength of the burden bearers was decayed. There was too much rubble in the wall, and they had to work and have a weapon in their hand at the same time. What does that represent to you and I in America? The fact that the strength of the burden bearers is decayed, it means that it's difficult for us to carry burdens now. We're becoming layered in burdens. Instead of carrying one, we're carrying many. What does it mean when the Bible talks about too much rubbish in the wall? We have cares of this life, deceitfulness of riches, lust of other things, financial burdens, just a bunch of rubbish that's bogging us down. What about the third part, having to work and have a weapon at the same time? I see as that no joy in your work, that getting up and going to work becomes a battle. Paying the bills becomes a battle. Now, there's five things that happen in Nehemiah's time. Follow me carefully because they're parallel to what we see happening today. First of all, Nehemiah 5, 1 through 2, there was a need for food and assistance for food from the government. Watch what happens. There was a great cry of the people and of their wives against the brethren of the Jews, for they said, we are sons and daughters are many, therefore we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. In other words, they were saying there that we're having a food shortage problem. We need assistance and we need help. In our nation, we're having a very heavy crisis with the number of people with needs just to eat on a daily basis. Notice this in the second thing is Nehemiah, in Nehemiah chapter 5 verse 1 and 2 they were having trouble financing their homes the Bible says so also there were they that said we have mortgaged our lands our vineyards and houses that we might buy, buy corn because of this drought in other words there was a mortgage crisis happening in Nehemiah's day it was taking everything they could get financially to take care of their daily needs that they didn't even have enough money to pay for their house payment or the payment and taxes on their land notice number three they were having to borrow money from the government. Nehemiah chapter 5 and 4. They were also them that said, We have borrowed money for the king's tribute and that upon our, that's upon our lands and upon our vineyards. We've seen that today, how there's had to be numerous bailouts, bailouts for banking industries, bailout for lending industries, bank, uh, bailouts for car industry, bailout, bailout, bailout. In other words, people, are, instead of having their own money in that day, had to lean on the king's tribute or the government government money in order to make it. These are parallels to what we see happening in America today. The fourth thing was they were bringing their sons and daughters or the future of their children into financial bondage. Nehemiah 5 and 5, we bring into bondage our sons and daughters to be servants. And some of our daughters are brought into bondage already. Neither is it in our power to redeem them for other men have our lands and have our vineyards. People don't realize, I think they don't pay attention, that the national debt being close to 16 trillion dollars may not put a burden on you, but it puts a burden upon your sons and daughters. The sons and daughters and the grandchildren of you and I are the ones that's going to suffer the most in the future because of what we see taking place. I think you can see that in the day of Nehemiah, the very things that were taking place in their process of trying to rebuild the house of God and trying to be obedient to God is actually being repeated again in our day and time. Now, here's the fifth thing. This is, this will really hit you. Watch this. Nehemiah chapter five and seven. They were brought into bondage because of the interest rates they were having to pay on the money they borrowed. Then I consulted with myself and rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said to them, you exact usury. Usury is an old English word for paying interest every one of his brothers. And I set a great assembly against them. See, Exodus 22 and 25, Leviticus 25 and 36 taught that if you were Jewish, you were not to charge interest to your brother. The reason that we have a mortgage crisis and the reason we have a financial crisis and the reason we have a government crisis is literally because of interest which is being charged at exorbitant rates which is bringing people into captivity and bondage do you understand they were having problems paying their mortgages they were having to glean on the government for food they were having to borrow money from the government to take care of their needs and then we find a situation where actually they were being charged overcharged interest that they couldn't even afford can anybody tell me does that sound like the day and time in which we're living in right now 
Now, we could keep you there, but let me tell you what happened in Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 2. Sanballat and Gershom, these were two Samaritans who were trying to distract the Jews, said to Nehemiah, come, let us meet together in the village in the plains of Ono. O-N-O. It's in your Bible. <laughs> but they thought to do me mischief. Now, if you want to know where we are with at least these five things happening, we are now in the plains of Ono. Oh no. <laughs> because we're saying, what? That, I'm paying that kind of interest? Oh, no. <laughs> you mean I got a shortage this month in my bills? Oh, no. <laughs> so, see, now we are all, I, could, I think we can all speak as Americans. It's not a black issue, white issue, Hispanic issue, Jew or Gentile issue. It's an American issue. We're down there in the plains of Ono. Oh we don't know what to do. But I hear Nehemiah say, I'm not leaving the presence of God to go down with you to have a discussion at the plains of oh no, because when you get when I get there, all you're going to do is do me mischief. So I said, God, show me what did Nehemiah do to pull his nation out of the difficulty they were in. Five quick things I want to share with you. Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 20, then answered I and said to them, the God of heaven will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build. Now, first thing Nehemiah did was he began to prefer prophetically proclaim that God was going to be with his people and that God would bless his people despite everything that was happening. Despite the breaches that were in the wall, they said, we are going to turn our attention to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we know that if we turn our attention to God, God is certainly going to prosper us in the days ahead. The second thing Nehemiah did, he prayed for the defeat of the opposition that was hindering him, Nehemiah 4.4. Hear, O God, for we are despised and turn the reproach upon their own head. Give them for a prey in the land of captivity. So he was saying, God, to us it wouldn't be a person necessarily as it would be the spiritual powers and the greed and the, all the different spirits and forces working against us. God, he, Nehemiah said, God, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to pray a prayer and have the people pray a prayer that the opposition that's keeping us from doing the will of God, from following God, from rebuilding what we need to build a nation again the way it should be. Stop the opposition, Father. Father. The third thing he prayed is he, Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 9, he began a night watch of prayer. Ne nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God and we set a watch against them day and night because of them. The enemy was coming. The enemy was barking. Sanballat and his Samaritan uh, enemies of Nehemiah were coming along telling them what they couldn't do, that God wasn't going to bless them nor was he going to help them and that they were going to stop the rebuilding. But Nehemiah said, here's what we're going to do. We're not just going to pray a little prayer in the morning. We're not going to be like Daniel and pray a three times a day prayer. We're going to have some all night prayer meetings. We're going to be like Jacob. We're going to pray all night till we wrestle the angel, until the angel of the Lord touches us and blesses us and brings us out. Let me tell you something, folks. We got to get back to doing what moms and dads and grandma and granddad did. When trouble came to the nation, they didn't blame the president. They didn't blame the house and the car. I'm tired of everybody blaming everybody else for their problems. I'm trying trying to tell you that if we want to get out of the mess we're in, we're going to have to go back and have some all-night prayer meetings and seeking God and calling upon the name of the living God that will bring deliverance and rescue us from the difficulty that we're in. The fifth thing that Nehemiah did was he immediately began to deal with the corrupt priesthood. Oh, Jesus. He began to straighten up the preachers. He began to straighten up their situation. You see, according to Nehemiah 10 through 13, some of the priests had married foreign women. And the, the law of Moses said that a priest had to marry a Jewish woman. You know why? Because the lineage of the Messiah had to come through a straight Jewish lineage. So Nehemiah told him, he said, you can do one of two things. You can either leave her and stay single the rest of your life and stay in the ministry or you can get out of the ministry because it says we cannot have priests breaking the law of God and continuing to have the favor of God. So what he did, let me say it this way, Nehemiah had to put a word in at the church. He had to lay it on the church. He had to lay it on the ministry. He had to lay it on the preachers and he had to say, preachers, get your act together. Preachers, start praying again. Preachers, start serving God again. Preachers, start obeying God again. Preachers, start preaching the word of God again can because the word of God is what sets people free. What is interesting is the word Nehemiah comes from two words that means the comfort of God. God wants to send his people comfort and he has because the parakletos that's the Greek word for comforter is the Holy Spirit. Our 
modern Nehemiah is the Holy Spirit himself. And the Bible tells us that he, the Holy Spirit brings us rest. In Isaiah 28, 11, it talks about praying uh, it with stammering lips and another tongue God would speak unto this people. God has given you and given me and you and all of us who believe a measure of the baptism of the Holy Spirit that at times when we don't know how to pray, Romans 8, the Holy Spirit will pray, making intercession for us. In the book of John, he will show us things to come. In the book of Jude, we build up our most holy faith by praying in the Holy Ghost. In Romans chapter 8, when we don't know how to pray, the Spirit of God will make intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. In 1 Corinthians 14, when I pray in the Spirit, my understanding is unfruitful, but my spirit is praying to God. May I encourage you today not to look to man, but to look to the paracletos, look to the comforter, look to the Holy Spirit, and begin to seek him and begin to call upon his name. Begin to believe him with all of your heart that he will bring help, strength, and deliverance to you. Because I believe with all of my heart that if the body of Christ in America ever gets their act together, if we ever start working as the body, if our attention, it will be focused in, in the kingdom, not into politics, not political issues, not black and white issues, not racist issues. I'm talking about if we'll start being the body of Christ, one voice, one people, and one nation, one holy nation, there is nothing that we cannot do if we will focus and turn to God call upon his name and as the Bible says in Chronicles turn from our wicked ways and depend on him to help us I want to tell you ladies and gentlemen one of the greatest things that you'll ever ever do in your life as a believer is always keep a tender heart toward God always keep a repentant spirit if you sin go to the Father stay humble before God never feel like you're more important than anybody else never exalt yourself in any way or any manner or any form because I believe what's happening is just as rabbi said the patterns of the Old Testament prophets for ancient Israel are being repeated in our day this is because we have the same patterns in the forming of our nation in the documents that we hold in our nation as did ancient Israel Israel. Now here's what I'd like for you to do. I would like for everybody in the studio to stand and join hands because we're going to pray. I have enough time to do this. You that are watching TBN, I would like for you, if you're away from God, if you have been a backslider, if you've been cold on God, to call the number on your screen right now where you're watching. And I want you to say, I want God to touch my heart again. I want the Lord to bring me back to him again. Now we're going to pray for you right now. God, as this entire audience comes together in the name of Jesus, to pray. I pray, O oh God, that the Spirit of the Lord will literally touch every man, every woman, and every boy, and every girl who is watching right now. Father God, there are so many prophetic parallels taking place. So many things happening that are patterns and cycles repeated in history to help us to see, as Rabbi said, the harbingers, the signs to get our attention and to warn us of what's coming. Father, I pray for the entire nation right now that we will understand that our problems are not political. They are spiritual. God, that taking the life of an innocent child is a spiritual problem, not a political issue. God, that men with men and women with women, it's not a political issue. It's a spiritual issue. Help us to understand, God, that this, there's a generation that's addicted. There's a generation that is in bondage and they need deliverers. God, raise up thousands of Moses and Aaron's. Raise up thousands of Joshua's. Raise up th thousands of Daniel's, Daniel's God and men and women, both men and women, Esther's of faith that will deliver a generation from the captivity that they're in. God, I pray for the backslider and the sinner right now, for that one that is away from you, that one that's turned this program on thinking it was just an accident, thinking there was nothing else to watch, but your spirit has touched them today. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we ask God for you to deliver them in the name of Jesus. Let them feel the freedom of the Spirit and the freedom of God in their heart and in their life right now. And everybody said amen. Now I want you to call the number. There are people standing by. Let's give the Lord a hand. I just sense his presence right now. There is someone who will pray for you. And I want you to understand something, that when, when these men have come to you today, 
and they've given you these prophetic words. I think more than ever before, we as believers should look into the prophetic scripture and teach our people those things that are taught in the Word of God. Because I like what Joe said. When you believe, and if you believe, that the Lord could come at any moment, trust me, the moment you do something wrong, you'll be repenting. Because you don't want to miss this great event. Keep a humble spirit. Keep a repentant heart. Pray for people. Love people. Pray for the country. Because I believe that if we will turn, as the rabbi said, if we will repent, we have an opportunity of changing things in the time that remains before the great return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I always want to take a moment and thank the Crouches, Paul and Jan, for many, many years of just dedicated ministry of wanting to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining me on TBN, and thank you for watching. And don't forget, Jesus loves you, and he's the best friend you'll ever have. We'll see you next time on TBN. God bless you. We're so glad you've been with us for Praise the Lord. TBN has a worldwide ministry. We need your love gifts, large or small, to help keep the gospel of Jesus Christ going around the world. So write today, Praise the Lord, P.O. Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711. Or in Canada, write TBN, P.O. Box 768, Station B, Ottawa, Ontario, K1P 5P8. If you haven't asked Christ into your life, Call our prayer partner now and pray to receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. Now until next time, remember to praise the Lord. This program has been brought to you through the prayers and contributions of our faithful partners throughout North America and the world.